Stangibalisco here, proprietor and operator of amateur radio station W1GV Whiskey One Golf Victor, with another little Murphy's Nemesis tale for you in some technical discussion, but not very technical. It's pretty simple, really. It's an antenna tuner that'll tune just about anything. In fact, it'll even tune nothing. Murphy is rolling over in her sweaty sheets right now, I'll bet you. I wanted to feed an end-fed uh, end half-wave length wire antenna on 160 meters against a marginal ground. I knew that it would work if I could get power into it because a half-wave length wire has an extremely high purely resistive impedance at the feed point, at the end. But that purely resistive impedance is very difficult to match. The advantage of having that high, high pure resistive impedance is that it minimizes the loss resistance in the ground. Even a marginal ground will work pretty well. But you got to get power into the doggone thing. And most transmetches just cannot handle the two or three or even four thousand ohms of radiation resistance impedance that appears at the feed point of such an antenna. But theory suggests a very simple design that ought to be able to do it. So I built that little thing, and by golly, it worked. So Murphy got confounded. If something could go right, it did. If something could go right in theory, it did. But there was another catch to that that really got Murphy having fits. And that is the fact that it worked even when theory said that it shouldn't. Take that, Murphy. That's Murphy's nemesis exactly in a nutshell. Murphy's Law seems to say if something can go wrong, it will. Well, Murphy's Nemesis says if something cannot go right, it will. If you've got the idea, and I guess I got it that time, I just got lucky. I'm not that smart. Just lucky sometimes. Here's the theory. Okay, well here is the schematic diagram of the antenna tuner that I had in mind to tune a half wavelength end fed wire against a marginal ground, probably just a ground rod driven into the earth or a ground rod with a few radials, but you're always going to have a few ohms of resistance, no matter how hard you try to make your ground perfect. You might, you're still always going to have at least a few ohms of resistance, and sometimes a surprisingly high amount, upwards of 50, 75, even 100 ohms. And if you have a low impedance antenna, low radiation resistance, say a quarter wave vertical, which is about 37 ohms of pure resistance, you're going to have a problem. If you have 37 ohms of ground resistance, then half of your output power is just going to go heating up the ground. A lot of people don't know that, and you'll still see an SWR of 37 plus 37 divided by your 50 ohm cable of 1.4 to 1 on your feed line, you'll think that things working great when really it's only 50% efficient. So to get good efficiency, if you get an antenna with say, oh let's just say an arbitrary figure. I said 2 to 4,000 ohms, let's just call that 3,000 ohms of pure resistive impedance, all comprising radiation resistance. And that will also take place, by the way, at a full wavelength, a wave and a half, two waves, and so on and so on. Although as you lengthen, the, as you increase the number of half waves in the antenna, you're going to 
get a little bit less and less of this resistance, it's going to be a little less each time. But a half wavelength on 160 meters is 260, <clears throat> 270 feet. So you're not likely going to go with more than that unless you have a pretty good sized piece of real estate going for you. So that was my plan anyway on 160 meters. Well, most conventional antenna tuners can't handle that. See, now if I had even 300 ohms of ground resistance here, I'd still end up with most of it getting uh, dissipated, as it were, quote unquote, dissipated in the radiation resistance R sub R as opposed to the loss resistance R sub L. There's a formula for calculating that efficiency and maybe sometime in a more theoretical video I'll give you all of that stuff, but right now basically the higher the ratio of the radiation resistance to the loss resistance, the better your efficiency will be. So you'd still get close to 90% efficiency with a 300 ohm ground resistance. So obviously you can see why I wanted to try and tune this thing. So I said, okay, suppose you take what is called a tank circuit. Not sure why they call this old circuit a tank. But you take a coil and an inductor L and a capacitor C and you set their values such that you get resonance in this circuit at the frequency of interest. Let's just say that's 1.805 megahertz. Just pulling a figure off the top of my top of my noggin here. Back in that day, that was about where the CW ops on 160 hung out. I think that may have changed though now. It's been so long since I've been on that band, but I needed to do that with a variable capacitor, so it had to be, you know, 365 picofarads or thereabouts or less. I happen to have a great big capacitor on hand uh, that was about 200 picofarads, a massive transmitting variable capacitor. And I also happen to have a roller inductor that I cannibalized from an old transmat that couldn't tune this stuff, but I cannibalized that roller inductor. It was a beautiful thing. Roller inductors are all very beautiful things. <laughs> And that's where this little tap, you can vary that tap on there. Now the idea is that you get resonance in this entire circuit here. They call it a tank, I guess, because it holds energy in a certain way, kind of trades it back and forth between uh, the inductance and the capacitance and holds it like that. And you end up with a very high impedance up here. You, for example, it'll match very well to 3000 ohms, but how do you get your radio to match to that? Well, once you've got this thing tuned to resonance, at 1.805 megahertz, then you just adjust that roller to get the tap so that you get a 50 ohm point on that tap. See, as you move this tap up the coil, you'll always get a purely resistive impedance at the tap, but that pure resistance will increase from zero down here at the bottom to the maximum, in this case, 3000 ohms up at the top. So you simply adjust it until it hits the point where it's 50 ohms and then theoretically you should get a one-to-one -one match on this coax that goes to the radio. And that is exactly what happened. You adjust it just like an ordinary transmat. You need an SWR bridge or reflectometer in your coaxial line there, but you just adjust the capacitance and the roller inductance until you get minimum SWR. Great! But I also found that this thing didn't have to be a half of a wavelength long. It could be any length. From a foot to a mile. From a nanometer to a light year. In fact, this thing would even tune to a one-to-one -one SWR with nothing at all connected to the top of it. But if you ran more than a few watts into it and tried to pull that stunt,
you'd get a hot inductor and you'd get arcing in your capacitor. Gee, I wonder why. Well, that would be Murphy's party. So I let Murphy have a laugh. I took the wire off of there and let that thing spark and get hot and all that good stuff, just so Murphy wouldn't feel completely abandoned. Because after all, if I were to kill Murphy off entirely, I wouldn't have anybody to mess around with anymore and make fun of anymore. Stan Jibalisco, W1GV, Whiskey One Golf, Victor. Signing off for this episode, 73, and so long.